great pleasure and privilege to have a chance to talk to John Rutter. John, I always start by asking when and where you, in this case, were born. In London, mm -hmm. 1945. Mm -hmm. Anywhere special in London? My parents lived over the pub run by my grandmother, mm -hmm. which is on a rather prominent site immediately opposite Baker Street tube station. Ah. I think that the building of the pub probably coincided with the coming of the Metropolitan Line, mm. and the thirsty travellers emerged from the station, and the first thing they saw was the Globe immediately opposite mm. in Marrowbin Road. Mm. And like many people, my parents couldn't find somewhere to live mm. when I was born at the end of the war. Housing, of course, was scarce. There'd been a lot of destruction in that immediate area. Mm. And so they gratefully accepted the hospitality of my grandmother in the rather nice flat which she had as a grace and favour apartment over the pub that she managed. And that was where I spent the first ten years of my life. Mm. This is just opposite Sherlock Holmes, I suppose. Isn't it? Or that's right. Uh, Baker Street, of mm. course, is famous mainly for a fictional character mm. who never actually lived there or <laughs> anywhere else. Mm. Um, but it was a busy bit of London, mm. close to the centre, and yet only five minutes away from Regent's Park, which was and still is idyllic. Mm. I remember Queen Mary's Rose Garden, where mm. my mum and dad would sometimes take me for walks. Mm. And it was an interesting part of London to grow up, I think, because it was both quite urban and at the same time not very far from, well, Hampstead Heath, where actually was where my parents moved when I was 10. They wanted to be just a little further away from the centre. They, for the first time, were able to afford a house, mortgage on a house, and a car of their own, a little used Standard 8 <laughs> which was a very proud possession. Mm. They didn't have much money. Um, my father worked in industrial chemistry. He, like many people in the Depression, had missed the opportunity to go to university at the time. He had to leave school to assist his mother in the family business. And he made up for that really later. Through London University, he was able to do a PhD, in fact, and I remember when I was just small, him with his papers spread out on the kitchen table. His subject was paper chromatography, <laughs> which meant very little to me except it involved these round circles of blotting paper called chromatograms. Mm. Um, you dipped a sort of wick from the paper. A sliver would be sliced from it and it would go into some chemical that you wanted to analyse. And the concentric rings of different colours told you a great deal about what was um, the makeup of the thing you were analysing. And gosh, that was the topic of his PhD. And so he became Dr. Rotter mm. during, I think, my first six or seven years. Mm. My mother um, stayed at home and looked after me. I was an only child at that point. And it wasn't until my sister came along when I was nine or ten that really they needed to move out because they needed somewhere larger. And at that point we went to live just off the Finchley Road, mm. um, a, a little nearer the school where by then I'd started, which was Highgate School in North London. It had been my father's old school, mm. a boys' school, where there was a strong musical tradition. Mm. And by that point it was apparent that I had a strong musical inclination. Mm. And possibly for that reason, my parents thought, well, maybe that's the place to go. I'm told, and I don't really remember this, I'm told that somebody came to the house and heard me singing in my piping treble voice. <laughs> At what age, age of about seven hmm. or eight, possibly a little younger. And they said, do you realise that this boy has got a very keen musical ear? And have you considered putting him in for a choristership? St Paul's Cathedral was suggested. And I don't know why, but I refused to do the audition. Um, I don't think it got as far as applying for it even, because I think my parents knew that I didn't want to live away from home. I knew very little about the life of a chorister, but I did know that it involved boarding. Mm. 
And I think I didn't want to be away from my parents at that point. And they didn't pursue the matter. But what they did do was send me to a school where there was a fine chapel choir and a strong musical tradition. And that's where I began my serious schooling at the age of nine. I'd previously been to a local nursery school, which um, was okay. We sang hymns in assembly every morning. And that was my first experience of group singing. I realised I loved it, loved it, mm. really loved it. Mm. Um, it just gave me, I suppose, the thrill that other kids would get from playing football. Mm. I was always hopeless at sport, could mm. scarcely catch a ball, and to this day I'm not very physically coordinated. Mm. But the singing lesson or the assembly at the start of the day were always the high points of my school day. I enjoyed all of my other school work too, but music was somehow what made the day special. When you said you, I mean this is just a sideline, but you, when you said you couldn't catch a ball, I'm not sure, but are you short-sighted? I'm short-sighted. I started to wear glasses when I was about eight or nine, those little wire-rimmed mm. national health things that were standard issue at the time. And um, the short sight was inherited from my mother. Mm. Um, my father, I think, had rather good eyesight actually mm. until his latest years. And, uh, of course, I saw the blackboard at school in a kind of impressionist painting mm. blur. Mm. So it's surprising that I did as well as I did. Mm. I think they spotted this and I, first of all, moved to the front mm. um, so I could see better. And then had an eye test and I got my first glasses, which I've worn ever since. My eyes haven't got particularly any worse mm. since my early 20s, but... Um, I suppose the upside of being short-sighted is that my night vision is good. <laughs> mm. Yes, well, there are many upsides, but we'll talk about that later. Um, tell me something about the character of your parents. What, what were they like as people? Well, my father was typical of his generation. He had a middle-class upbringing in Newcastle, interestingly, mm. where his father had been a marine engineer. Mm. And my father was rather reserved rather quiet, um, a scientist by training, mm. and rather discontented probably in the job that he did. He worked for various of the food industry giants. At one time he was with the Beecham Group, at another time with the Lions Group, and finally Cadbury's. And so he spent his whole working life doing a job he really didn't like. And for that reason, when he was at home, we saw another side of him, his hobbies were important to mm. him because he didn't really enjoy the paid work that he did. And he had a hobby that I find inexplicable, I must say. He loved um, target shooting. Mm. And at weekends he would go off to Bisley, mm. which was where there were shooting ranges mm. um, for recreational target shooters, I suppose, <laughs> and would take me fairly unimpressed <laughs> expecting me to feel tremendously enthusiastic about mm. it, which I really wasn't. And he tinkered with all kinds of other hobbies and pursuits, some of which were aimed at making money and none of which ever succeeded. Um, mm. There was a craze for model planes, mm. I remember, in mm. the late 50s. Mm. And he devised a form of rocket fuel for these things which just flew rather pointlessly around the <laughs> skies for about two or three minutes before they fell to earth. Mm. And I shared that interest to an extent. And he later became interested in um, just freelance chemical research. Mm. So he would spend hours with his microscopes and pestles and mortars at home. Um, his world was not really my world. He did take me along to his laboratory mm. and show me the microscopes and all the rest of it. And I was fascinated, I must mm. say, but it never took. Mm. I believe that I said for some period in my childhood, oh, well, I think I might be a scientist like my dad. Mm. But um, we inhabited different worlds. He, in turn, didn't really belong to my world of music. Mm. He was fond of music, mm. but never had any musical training. And he could play by ear rather badly, but never sought to improve his technique. Mm. And I think his taste really ran only to the dance band hits of his youth. And I remember him playing, stumbling through the keys, mm. 
uh, playing the songs of the 1930s with his youth. He never really moved on from there. So our world, worlds didn't coincide much. Mm. He was a quiet man, I think it's true to say. But later I found out, really not till after his death, uh, that he was very proud of my achievements. Mm. And that was sort of heartwarming. And he was possibly more overtly affectionate with my sister, who was 10 years younger than me, as my only sibling. Mm. Perhaps because she came along later and unexpectedly. Perhaps because she was a girl. Mm. Perhaps because I was quite difficult and reserved myself. Mm. And so we coexisted under the same roof, but we didn't have a close father-son relationship. And I think I must certainly take at least 50% of the blame for that. My mother was impulsive and emotional. She had hoped for an education, but because of the war, it was denied her. Um, typical of many, many people you could talk to of my age whose parents experienced first the Depression and then the war, and whose careers and lives were really blighted by those two great events. My mother was younger than my dad, and at the time she might have gone on for some professional training in acting, which is what she really wanted to do. The war came, she had to work, and she found actually a job for more or less the rest of her life as a telephonist, because she had a lovely cultured speaking voice more cultured actually than the background she came from because her mother um, was a publican and had originally um, been from the East End and there was a bit of old Cockney in mm. my dearly loved grandma's maternal grandma's voice which neither my mother nor her sister inherited um, they not deliberately but just I think because they valued beautiful speech, they poshed up their mm. accents mm. and so she found work for Western Union mm. in, in the heart of the city during the war, it's a very dangerous sort of place to work quite honestly because there would be days where the tube line would get bombed and you couldn't arrive at work, I mean she told me these tales of it and so she was thwarted in her ambitions and goals by the war and partly I suppose by motherhood because they couldn't really afford childcare. Like a lot of women after World War II, I think her horizons hadn't been expanded by feminism or by the thought that she could take her own personal development further. And so she acted in an amateur way. And I remember going to productions she was in where her talent was quite highly praised. But she was what we would now call a homemaker, mm. I suppose. Mm. And I was quite a handful, so <laughs> I suppose I can sort of see why. And it wasn't till later that she, when I went to university, she decided she wanted to do GCSEs. Mm. And she did a couple of A-levels after that. Um, so I admire her greatly for that, that she felt that she'd missed something. But she was warm and impulsive the sort of person who would buy anything at the door you know, <laughs> and believe anything that anyone told her. Mm. And she was loving towards you. Yes, she was. Um, she was. And because she knew absolutely nothing about music, mm. neither she nor my father were ever anything other than encouraging mm. about music because they didn't know how to intervene mm. or to warn me that it's actually a rather precarious profession mm. where only the very talented will mm. succeed. Mm. If they had known more about it, they might have discouraged me. I don't think they would have succeeded. But mm. as it was, they just took simple parental mm. pleasure and pride in my achievements along the musical way, really, during, mm. during those years. And so, th in some ways, they were the best kind of parents. If I couldn't have parents who were professional musicians mm. who could actually train me Mm. Um, in the way that some parents do their musical offspring. The next best thing you can hope for is, I think, parents who are just encouraging and appreciative. Mm. And that was what I had. I think I had a clear sense that music was what I wanted to do mm. from very early on. When did you start learning a musical instrument? It began with the old out-of-tune upright piano mm. in my parents' flat. Mm. That It was on the top floor. And 
it had been somehow winched in through the window, I think, because it certainly wouldn't go down the stairs again. There were rather narrow, winding stairs. And so the previous occupants, or maybe the occupants before them, left this rather battered upright piano which stood in a corner of the living room. And I discovered it. So that was really when I began How to learn music. Then? Probably about four or five years old, mm. I raised the lid one mm. day and started picking away at the keys mm. and discovered a world that was somehow my world. And the interesting thing was that I played by ear, so I'm told, mm. tunes that I'd heard on the radio or whatever it might be. It could almost only have been on the radio or possibly hymns I'd sung at nursery school. And I always preferred making up things of my own than playing what had already been written. And so before I really knew anything about music in a formal sense, I was improvising and giving little fantasy titles to my improvisations. Um, they would be terribly banal, I mean things like um, the lake or, mm. um, you know, the, the, the deep in the forest or mm. birds at dawn or whatever it might be. Mm. And um, so in a very unstructured way, I began to learn something about the piano. Somebody then bought me a book of scales, I think, an elementary piano instruction. It must have been my parents. And not long after that, they realised that this was something that was taking wing in my heart. And they probably should send me for piano lessons. So I went to um, a wonderful lady, rather stern and forbidding, as piano teachers were in those days, uh, called Mrs Melville. And I had a weekly lesson with her in Kentish Town. And she realised that I was never going to be a great pianist, which I'm not, I'm not good at all. Um, it's a physical coordination thing. Uh, the brain gives the instructions which the fingers don't always carry out. But I did have a nice voice. And so she concentrated more and more on um, giving me songs to sing and accompanying me. And our lessons passed more pleasantly once we started doing that, rather than just making me practice the fingering of scales, which to this day I'm still rather shaky on. And the sad thing was, I suppose, um, just thinking about playing keyboard or any other instrument, that by the time I wanted to do it and really wanted to practice, it was too late um, because I began to take, um, well, it was the organ, really. I began to take it seriously when I suppose I was about 14. Mm. And by then, the muscular patterns are set and it's very difficult to recapture the lost years, but you do have to start young. And I, oddly enough, never had any strong desire to play another instrument because already by then I think I knew I preferred writing mm. um, and singing. So um, I, I had piano lessons and that was the beginning of it, but it all took off when I went to Highgate School. We had a fine music master in the junior school called Martin Dale Sidwell, mm. who was the director of music at Hampstead Parish Church, which was almost like a cathedral in terms of the standard of its choir. And it was customary then for quite a few ex-King's Choral Scholars mm. who were in London to join that particular choir because it had such a fine reputation. Well, he came into Highgate Junior School and helped to teach me singing and tried to recruit me for the Hampstead Parish Church Choir, which for <laughs> some reason I resisted. Mm. Um, I would have learned from it. It's a shame I didn't. Mm. But um, music was quite an important part of the curriculum throughout that school. And really it's to school rather than home that I owe my musical instruction. Mm. So what age did you go to Highgate? About 10, was it? The nine? junior school I started just when I was 10, yeah. um, progressed to the senior school just around my... And that's when you were, more or less, when you went up to live in Hampstead? Yes, that's right. Um, and then... Um, the senior school, almost on my 13th birthday, my birthday mm. September, and so I, I always became a year older when the new school And this year. was a day, day boy? Campus. It was um, mostly a day school. I think there were about one quarter of the school boarding, and now the boarding side has dropped away, but um, I was a day boy, mm. and walked up the hill 
towards Jack Straw's castle, the Whitestone mm. Pond at the top of Hampstead Heath, which mm. is where I picked up the 210 bus to take me to school. Then later I was allowed my first bicycle <laughs> and after that I um, began to go by bike, have good leg muscles I would think to this day, <laughs> probably because of the hills of mm. Hampstead and Highgate. Mm. I was very lucky, my parents could barely afford it. I won a scholarship on entry to the senior school which did lower the cost considerably mm. but my mother wasn't earning um, until a little later my father's salary was probably fairly meagre for all that he was a qualified man mm. and I think they really did want to give me a good education if they could and so I owe them a great debt for that really. My sister who came along later was fortunate in that Camden High School for Girls mm. was a state school but with a high reputation academically mm. and so she got her education free. Mm. Um, my parents paid for mine and they could scarcely have picked a better school because the school choir was really renowned at that time. Mm. We were the choir of choice for symphonic works done in London that needed a boys choir. Mm. There's a sort of select mm. repertoire of works like the Karloff Carmina Burana, mm. the Mahler Third Symphony, and of course most famously the Benjamin Britten War Requiem. Mm. These call for a boys choir alongside the full resources. And um, we were the ones who were called in because we were good and we were local. Mm. And I vividly remember that it was a great day when we were chosen to be the boys choir in the recording of Benjamin Britten's War Requiem in 1963. By that point my voice had changed mm. but I got in under the wire as a rather <laughs> squawky alto and to just be a fly on the wall um, at, a, at a, an event like that where we knew musical history was being made mm. was extraordinary. I was very fortunate and that wouldn't necessarily have come to me if I'd gone to a cathedral choir school. I would have had other experiences but we did have a fine school chapel choir mm. where we did cathedral type repertoire so I got to know quite a lot of the same music mm. Sunday by Sunday because we had to show up on a Sunday to be there for the boarders service, you see. And every morning we had a 15-minute act of worship with which the day began. It didn't make, in the end, a religious man out of me, but it gave me a kind of mental furniture, mm. a working repertoire of a couple of hundred hymns, large chunks of the Bible, bits of the Psalms off by heart, all of which are just there um, mm. and they'll only be erased by death mm. um, and I think that that was one of the most formative influences and of course mine was the last generation which experienced the King James Bible. Mm. The 1611 Bible went out really in my sixth form years mm. when the New English Bible came in mm. and we had a slightly avant-garde chaplain who thought well let's um, experience the shock of the new. So the authorised version was ceremoniously removed from the brass eagle in the chapel and the NEB substituted mm. and all of us groaned mm. because um, ignorant and young as we were I think we appreciated the cadences and the rhythms of fine English mm. and the NEB sounds like a committee product and I suppose the 1611 Bible was too but my goodness it was magnificent mm. and those were still the days when public reading was taken seriously and so we had members of our staff and sometimes boys from the school would read every morning from the Bible and uh, that did give me something mm. it really did so it was a remarkable school, academically did a very decent job with all of us. I disliked the sport and was made to do more of it than I would have wished because I sensed it as mm. a waste of time. It wasn't what I wanted to do and I think I felt focused even then. Perhaps mistakenly, I thought I don't want to waste time on things that aren't going to have anything to do with my later life. And I think we also, generally as a human trait, don't like doing things that we're no good at. <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes people do but I really was no good at sport and it mm. did play a large part in our life so that's really the only regret but academically and musically I had nothing but good teaching certainly by the standards of the time and Cambridge followed on in a very natural sort of way because my director of studies in the sixth form modern languages John Dare had been at Clare John uh, Dare 
Yes, hmm. he later became headmaster of Biddeford Grammar School. And he was fairly young, had been at Clare in the 50s, and said, well, look, you know, what about Cambridge? And Clare's a nice college. Hmm. And that slightly chimed in with what I was beginning to think, because my first inklings about Cambridge as a place I wanted to study were not because of him or Clare, but because of hearing King's College Choir. First and foremost, I suppose, on Christmas Eve, as the nation did in mm. those days, and still does, mm. but also from the recordings. Mm. I think we had in our school record library a number of the recordings from the Boris Ord era, mm. and the early ones, of course, from the David Wilcox era, and they just called to me. Mm. I remember thinking, I want to be where all this happens. But something in me said, I'm not going to apply to King's because I'm intimidated by its reputation and I feel I might be overwhelmed. The other thing was that I was slightly um, sailing under false colours because my headmaster was adamant that I should apply for a Cambridge scholarship in modern languages, which was half of what I was doing for A-level, the other half being music. And he said, no, music is very chancy, don't touch it. And I actually entered for Music A-Level by subterfuge in collusion with the Director of Music. I <laughs> haven't mentioned his name yet, but mm. he was a great man. He was called Edward Chapman. By the time I knew him at Highgate, he had been teaching there for the best part of 40 years. He'd been organ scholar at Pembroke College, Cambridge in the early 20s. And he remembers being the last candidate examined for the degree of Bachelor of Music by Stanford, <laughs> who was then the Professor of Music, mm. and had clung on to the professorship because he needed the money, basically. Mm. And uh, he still had to chair the Viva Voce mm. examinations. Well, Edward Chapman was passed in his Bachelor of Music, which was wonderful. And he then came down from Cambridge, and after a brief interlude teaching at Portsmouth Grammar School, came to Highgate where he served all his days and he obviously thought Cambridge was the place where I should go and encouraged me, almost a lone voice really in the school to do music. The thing was that my musical gifts weren't as apparent as if I had been a performer. Mm. For example I was at school with John Taverner um, mm. who of course is now hugely noted as a composer mm. but at the time in the school was thought of equally as an extraordinarily gifted pianist mm -hmm. and would rattle off concertos in our summer concert and mm -hmm. we had Howard Shelley who was of course another fine pianist who later won all kinds of awards for his recordings of Rachmaninoff and, and other virtuosic piano mm -hmm. music too but I was rather less obviously gifted I composed but felt under the shadow of John Tavener Several of us composed, actually. Um, it was encouraged by Edward Chapman, who himself learned composition from Charles Wood, who mm. was Stanford's successor as professor of music here. Mm. And that was the tradition, a very honourable one, of what you call the organist composer. That's to say somebody who um, worked in a cathedral or somewhere like that, basically as an organist, but it was taken for granted that you would have compositional skills and expertise and would from time to time deliver yourself of it might be some choral anthems or organ music or whatever. And that's quite died out now, really. Organists are too busy and too specialised. But in those days, it was fully expected that an organist would be a competent and well-versed composer. Charles Wood was. Um, he, of course, was director of music at Keyes College here. And Edward Chapman was. He was a good organist and taught me the organ, in fact, but um, would compose quite regularly in a conservative but very well-versed kind of way. He, had, he understood voices, he understood instruments, he understood what worked, he had a lovely sense of text setting. And had he chosen to devote himself to composition, he might have become quite noted, but schoolmastering claimed him. And I suppose he carried with him that thought that, well, anybody who calls themselves a musician should compose, at least have a go at it, be able to do it. And so all of us did. And there was quite a, 
clan, really, of active musicians at Highgate. I mean, of the school which numbered 650, I suppose almost half were in the concert chorus, which was the large choir. And there was, of course, the smaller chapel choir and all sorts of other subgroups as well, vocal and instrumental. But there was every encouragement to compose and every encouragement to hear our work performed when we composed it. There was an annual school music competition where you got extra points for the number of instruments you included in the instrumental ensemble class. And so if you could turn yourself into an arranger and say, well, we've got a tuba player who can only manage about four notes, but if we put him in the group, then we'll get an extra couple of points. <laughs> and so all of us developed skills. I mean, there were 12 houses in Highgate School, and therefore there were at least 12 active arrangers. There had to be mm -hmm. under the terms of the music competition. When I think back to it, it was remarkable, actually. Um, and ever so many of us became professional musicians not just John Tavener and Howard Shelley, whom I mentioned, but Andrew Lloyd Webber's orchestrator, David Cullen, who was actively composing mm -hmm. at the time I was there, Brian Chappell, who specialises in writing educational music these days. It's, it's quite a, a, a place when I look back on it. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I got into composition professionally was that I was encouraged to think of it as normal. Mm -hmm. And I realised how fortunate I was. The other thing was, encouragement does make a huge difference. And Edward Chapman, um, to whom I would shyly hand in my compositions every so often and say, what do you think of this, sir? Would give me um, a sharp critique, but never a discouraging one. Mm. And I remember him writing in a school report um, at a time when I was getting quite bad ones, you know, usually for being lazy or stroppy or hmm. uh, awkward, he would write reports which glowed. And I thought, well, this is one awfully good reason for going in for music, because I've got somebody who's championing me. Hmm. And he said to me, um, I think that this boy will end up in the world of composition and his talent will probably take him to America. <laughs> which was extraordinarily prophetic because, mm. in fact, quite a lot of my career has taken place in America where my work was mm. recognised. Mm. Almost, I would say, before it was widely recognised here at home. Mm. And so, gosh, he was a far-sighted man. The other thing I always remember him saying was, when you're at Cambridge, he said, get to know David Wilcox. Well, uh, I didn't have to try because I was placed in his harmony and counterpoint class mm. in my second year. And I think it's fair to say that David talent spotted me. Mm. But I look back and think what a huge debt I owe to the teaching I received at Highgate and to the friends I made there and the collegial atmosphere. Somehow composition became cemented into me mm. um, at an age where a lot of a lot of young people would say, mm, well, I don't know, um, I don't know whether I can really make it or whether I'd be safer doing something else. And I suppose I did think of playing for safety career-wise. In the early and mid-60s, we probably didn't worry about careers as much as we do now, that there was fairly full employment. Mm. And one sort of assumed that as a graduate, well, you'll find some sort of a job. But nonetheless, composition was slightly off the dials, and I don't think it was until I found that my work was beginning to sell, and this is jumping ahead in the story, but once I was in print, which was all thanks to David Wilcox, mm. it wasn't really till then that I thought, well, gosh, I'm well on the way to making a living from this, mm. that I sort of fell into it. But the urge to compose was, I think, always there, right from the very early years when I was sitting at the upright piano, my feet probably not yet able to reach the pedals, mm. and just doodling away. Mm. Lovely. Um, at some point, uh, you mentioned that the reading of the Bible and learning these hymns and so on um, instilled in you a love of the beauty of, of the texts and the, and the call of music, but you implied not much more than that. Um, since you've been, 90% of your professional career has been to do with church music, 
I wouldn't put it as high as 90%. No, right. I mean, f let's say over half. Over half. Mm. Um, I've, I've always asked, I've asked Stephen and, and David about mm. their religious feelings and also a lot of scientists and so on. Um, what, I mean, sometimes you can start with what your parents, what they believe, but what, how would you place yourself religiously through your life? friend, fellow traveller and agnostic supporter <laughs> of the Christian faith, <laughs> uh, in a nutshell. Um, mm -hmm. To go back to the parental background, um, in those days people by default described themselves as Church of England mm -hmm. if they didn't really have any religious affiliation. Mm -hmm. My father's family were Quakers mm -hmm. and that was something that my dad's older sister clung on to. She was a devout Quaker to the end of her days. She only died at the age of almost 100 just mm. last year. Mm. But he lost that mm. and never attended church or spoke of anything religious until the end of his life. He began attending the nearest church to their home in Finchley Road, which was actually a Presbyterian church. And um, I don't think he was particularly a convinced Presbyterian more than anything else. But for whatever reason, he began to attend. And I think I'm right in saying that he sought confirmation. Mm. This was uh, sort of after I was living at home. I mean, by then I was here in Cambridge. And so I didn't follow that particular saga. But now you mention it, I believe he got confirmed and never had, for whatever reason, at school... As indeed I didn't. Um, what happened at Highgate was that the chaplain, who was doubtless very correct and proper, said, well, look, um, you know, this isn't a mass inoculation. Uh, what I want all of you to do in this class by next week is to write me a letter, which need not be more than one side of paper, on why you would like to get confirmed. And so... And those who were not of other faiths came back and mostly delivered their letter the next week. And I didn't have any letter to hand him. I really don't remember whether I was disinclined mm. or lazy or just rebellious. Mm. Because I didn't particularly like the chaplain, which was, I'm sure, my fault, not mm. his. Um, though, interestingly, he ended up uh, as an atheist later. <laughs> <laughs> having had a professional scandal when he later went on to teach at London University. Mm. And um, there was some major problem in his career after that. Maybe children can pick things up. Mm. I knew there was something perhaps not quite right. But at any rate, I, I, I'd, I'd like to say, well, I thought it through. Mm. And I just thought, well, I have this objection or that objection to the Christian faith as such. I do remember that year he tried to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity and it really, as a 13-year-old, was over my head. Mm. Uh, but for whatever reason, I didn't join the queue to mm. get confirmed. I sang happily in the chapel choir. Um, I was always interested in religious studies. Mm. But somehow, being a non-joiner became a habit. And although I think I probably was religious in quite a powerful sense when I was young and into my 20s. Not least, I suppose, because I felt so lucky as my career began to take off and things began to go well for me and I found happiness and fulfilment in the way of life that I had never really thought I would gain entry to as a composer. You're a member of a pretty elite club and I used to, to every night, before I went to sleep, I used to try and compose my thoughts and say, I want to think about the good things that have happened. And I want to try and spare a thought for everybody who's going to sleep tonight, frightened or being abused or bullied or mm -hmm. poor or starving, you know, and to just be grateful. And so it was a kind of theology of gratitude, mm. which is probably not really something you can motor on very far because what happens when something goes wrong in your life? Mm. And I suppose that sense of there must be some benevolent deity behind all this, otherwise it wouldn't be going so well, is a bit like American religious thought, 
in that um, when I began to travel to America, I started meeting an awful lot of Christians. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and they were what I would call, some of them, good time Christians. That's mm. to say, we are being blessed by God because we're uniquely good people and uniquely a good people as and Americans. And your American friends are going to be listening to you here, so... Well, um, I, I, what I would say is the American faith world contains some of the very finest and most searching of theology and religious thought and practice, and some of the worst. Mm. And I think it's fair to say I experienced a full spectrum, mm. that religion matters intensely to Americans. Mm. I found that out quite quickly when I began to visit there. And I, I sort of respect that. I mm. certainly respect all religious faiths. But if I wanted to be honest about my own faith journey, it's been backwards mm. over the years. And I'm afraid what slightly began to sow the seeds of doubt was seeing the absolute certainty of religious adherence in America and some of the harm that that certainty could lead to in that you could become intolerant of others or... Um, convinced that only you are right mm. and that there's no other possible way and I always started by thinking well hang on surely there must be many paths to mm. God you know if there is one God the controlling intelligence behind the universe then he's not going to mind how he's addressed or what building you're in when you do it and I slightly went from there to a, a rather tougher position still which is that the universe is basically numbers and that it's in some sense mathematical and that it's a lottery. And if there is a controlling deity, he's a bit like a mafia don who's capable of doing good, kind, charitable things, but also almost, you might say, takes pleasure in doing malicious and harmful things and sowing the seeds of long-running dissent and problems. Um, and that's hard to reconcile with the Christian concept of a loving God and I don't also find it very helpful to say that you have to have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus. Um, numerous of, of my um, religious friends and uh, indeed people I've just met have said well you know if you're not born again and if Jesus isn't your personal friend mm -hmm. then you're not a true Christian. And I also remember the words of um, Charlie Mull, the Reverend Professor Charlie Mull, who was the most searching theologian, um, Lady Margaret Professor here, of course, at, at Cambridge. And he said, well, you know, um, I'm perfectly sure that I've only been born once. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, was from a strongly evangelical tradition. Yeah. Um, I think possibly um, my personal dislike of... Um, the evangelical mindset. That's not to say I don't think people should share their beliefs, mm. but it's the style of worship it goes with and the style of thought it goes with. Um, completely runs counter to everything that I've been trained to believe as somebody who's had the kind of education I've had and background I've had. People sometimes have asked me, um, did the fact that your son got killed mm. um, affect your faith position? This happened in 2001, and he was 19 and a student here at Cambridge, and he got run over crossing Queen's Road one night. Completely unforeseen, completely random. And I think the answer is no, it really didn't, um, because by then I wouldn't have described myself as a believing Christian. On the other hand, you have to consider the alternatives. Um, a world without any churches or space for religious thought or contemplation or a world based only on material values would be a hell you know I'm sure it would and in a sense whether you believe the specific doctrines of a faith I think that um, just the statement it makes about how man shall not live by bread alone is immensely important and music is a part of that because, of course, music is useless in a literal sense. You don't have to have music to survive. It's not like food or shelter or medicine. 
but yet it's always been there. And imagining a world without it is just, uh, it's impossible. It couldn't be. And so I think a world without faith is an impossibility. I think we're made that way. And even though you might say, and I, I think I slightly would say that religion is an invention of man, you know, that man created God in a way, mm. in, in the image that they want, mm. rather than the reverse. I don't think that invalidates its, its worth. Um, I suppose why I started to think that we create a God that suits us is that I began to visit American communities and see different sorts of churches of many denominations. I would come in as an honoured guest, but nonetheless you get a pretty good idea parachuting in what people's beliefs were. And if you meet Southern Baptists, you know, they believe in a God that doesn't really go in for terribly much rational thought and a God that's judgmental, um, a God that supports uh, Republican <laughs> you know, God doesn't vote Democrat. Mm. Um, on the other hand, if you go to um, a, a major university, mm. you might find a very different image of God there in, on the university campus chapel. So uh, it, it began to look to me as if the whole edifice of religion was um, a man-made construct. I and think, uh, Montaigne said if triangles had invented a God, he would have three sides. <laughs> that that was it. So I suppose that's um, in a way uh, it, that's not a terribly inspiring story to to tell you of a faith journey because people would always rather it was the other way round. Mm. Um, I remain hugely sympathetic to the church, its music, its liturgy, its traditions, and with some caveats, its ministry, mm. what it's trying to do. On the whole, the church that I know. Um, and was baptised into is trying to do good in a difficult situation and it's making a statement on behalf of qualities like compassion, forgiveness, charity that everybody would support and so I would be heartbroken if the Church of England closed its doors tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I hope to be buried um, in a country churchyard with um, a funeral service according to the 1662 prayer book and all my favourite pieces of music. I suppose that's wanting it both ways, isn't it? That you want the trappings uh, without uh, necessarily subscribing to the doctrine. But um, that's where I am. I think there are quite a lot of people like me. Um, Vaughan Williams was sort of similar, wasn't he? In that I think he had a sense of generalised spirituality which was triggered by things like standing on top of the Malvern Hills and contemplating the beauty of nature or um, walking through the west door of a cathedral and being awestruck by the grandeur and mystery of the building or um, being inspired by Pilgrim's Progress, the words of John Bunyan. Mm. And I think he wouldn't have called himself a card-carrying Christian, yet his life was steeped in Christianity at every point. And I would probably have to say I'm like that. And my moral compass, to use that awful phrase, probably does derive in large part from Christian ethic and teaching. So I owe Christianity a huge, huge debt. And it's rather ungrateful of me not to believe in it more. <laughs> <laughs> and you've put that very nicely. Just one last question on that. I mean, many people who don't know what it is like to be a great musician or a composer but watch films on Mozart for instance <laughs> um, they often come across sort of uh, descriptions that such a person as Mozart is in touch with divinity that, that, they, that they act as a kind of um, intermediary between some other spiritual world and this world they're almost like shamans in my discipline um, so there's a mystery and a beauty which I've also heard about from physicists and, and scientists, and Einstein talks about this. He wasn't a Christian, obviously, but mm. the wonder and mystery is there, um, but there's no particular God. Is that how you see it? Stravinsky said when he wrote The Rite of Spring, I was just a vessel through which the music passed. Exactly, yes. And, of course, 
that was really the debate at the heart of Peter Schaeffer's play Amadeus, mm. wasn't yes. it? Yeah, exactly. Which was conveyed much better in the play than in the subsequent film, which mm. rather trivialised it. But um, if you believe that there are some humans who are chosen to be a vessel, mm. a conduit, mm. or whatever, then why is it that that particular job is given to the undeserving as well as to the deserving? And there's no answer. But I do think that there's such a thing as genius. Mm. If I didn't believe that, I think I'd pack up. Mm. I, I haven't got it, but I think that it does reveal itself. And it's not the same thing as talent. Genius is something that transforms life something that is memorable and you never forget it and music is a very good way of expressing it mathematics i'm sure must be another because in both cases they're rather pure music is pitched sounds which vibrate in strict arithmetic ratios and the stricter the ratio then um, the more beautiful the sound in a way that the mystery of a major chord is extraordinary that it's all just mathematical ratios and of course the ancients believed that this in some way tied in with um, the music of the spheres and the order of creation and of the universe I'm not so sure there's not something in that you know um, I don't know why some composers have genius but I think they probably are in some way messengers from another world and they're just chosen usually those who have been chosen work very hard indeed and those that don't squander their gift I mean there have been examples of that mostly I think the composers known to me um, and those I've read about seem to have had a sense of responsibility or put it another way they're driven but I think we're all driven in the world of music it's very hard for any of us to relax with other things. Mm. I've tried in recent years to mm. uh, take up a hobby of sound recording, mm. which um, I find absorbing and relaxing, mm. but different. But there is always something, rather like I imagine an addiction must feel like, that calls us back to the writing table. And although I don't compose full time, I've always divided my energies between composition and conducting, and in my earlier life, teaching. Mm. Um, I sort of, sort of feel bad if I haven't written anything for weeks or months. There's a kind of itch, mm. there's an uneasiness and a feeling, oh, well, I really ought to be getting on with the next piece. And I'm a quite reluctant composer because I don't terribly enjoy the times I spend doing it. It's very demanding, it's tiring, it's only intermittently fruitful because any of us have days when nothing useful comes. I mean, you always try and write something. Mm. And like most writers known to me, I try to be disciplined about the hours I keep when I'm working on a piece. You, you work in a little cottage, I gather. Yes, I, I decided that I always had excuses not to compose if I was at home. And there are always distractions in the form of the phone ringing or when the children were younger and the noise around the house. And so I thought I would find somewhere completely isolated. And that is where I go to compose, and only to compose, really. It's a small cottage five miles from where we live in Duxford. And it's, it's been a, a safe haven. It's lovely. Mm. Mm. Uh, however, I can't tell you truthfully that the hours I spend there are all that happy. Mm. I'm glad when the end is in sight, mm. when I can see that, look, it's only going to take another day or two, and I'll got this nailed that's a great feeling <laughs> and having a piece finished is is good I feel relief for a while and then the process of performance begins I may or may not be involved in that I mm. mean sometimes I'm due to conduct a premiere myself mm. and that's great sometimes um, I'm just there in the audience and invited along to rehearsal to comment and of course yes it is an exciting moment when you actually hear the music for the first time in real life rather than just in your head. That's what we live for, I think. 
that much more than any reaction that anyone has to it. It's always nice if people appreciate and enjoy what you've done. But even though I'm a commercial writer in the sense that I've always made it my livelihood, I don't really mind what anybody thinks of what I've done. It's whether I'm pleased with it. I think C.P. Bach, um, son of Johann Sebastian, mm. put it rather well when he said, well, if you don't please yourself, then you can't hope to please anyone else. And because I've been, I suppose, commercially successful, people accuse me of just targeting my music at an uncritical audience and, as it were, writing down. Um, hand on heart, I hope I don't do that. I do try to write simply because when I think back to my dad, um, he had no musical learning, but I think he could recognise music that spoke from the heart. And there are a lot of people like that. And of course you can write for a sophisticated and knowledgeable elite. And there are plenty of people doing that. I've never felt called to do that myself. I've always preferred to write for people like my parents or friends, or my sister, who is not musically trained, but she knows a good piece when she hears one. It's a shame to exclude people, possibly because I was an only child, possibly because neither of my parents were musicians. Um, I felt some need through the music I write to be accepted. Leonard Bernstein said the same thing, which was interesting. It wasn't until I read his memoirs that he said, well, neither of my parents knew the first thing about music. And so I always wanted to write music that everybody would like. Mm. And I think possibly I have that same... Is, it, is that everybody would like, so my parents would like it, or my parents would look around and find that everyone liked my music and therefore they would be pleased? Is it the latter? Or both, the latter? I think. Mm. A bit of both. Mm. But um, no, I, hope I, don't, I hope I don't write down... But I do like to be inclusive. Um, and again, a word, a word that's become, unfortunately, devalued these days is accessible. Mm. Uh, it's become the sort of mantra of arts organisations everywhere. And you can't always please everybody. I mean, that does have to be written in gold letters mm. above every composer's desk, that whatever you write. You, you will never find that everybody likes it. Mm. That's life. It's like... Um, as a person, one would hope that people would like you. Mm. But it comes sometimes as a shock to discover, probably in the playground at school, mm. that some people just won't like you, <laughs> no matter how lovely you know, other people might think you are. Mm. And that just is life. And the same is true with one's compositions. You, you really can't suit everybody. On this fascinating point you made that you know or believe in genius, you don't believe you are yourself one. And the two questions, one is, have you met any living geniuses, or who are the geniuses in the past you, you most think of as geniuses? And the second is, how do you know you're not one? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't have any very exciting, um, unexpected answers to mm. the first question, because I put Bach... I suppose at the top of the tree because he got everything. Mm. Um, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn. There was a particular moment really in the 18th century when somehow everything came together in a particular bit of Europe. What about Handel? Yes, certainly. Um, and of course, I mean, uh, you know, one can stretch back. I mean, uh, the, the Renaissance composers like Palestrina and Victoria, mm -hmm. were all geniuses, but operating, I suppose it's fair to say, within a more specialist area. Mm -hmm. The great thing about um, Mozart and Bach and Beethoven was their universality, mm -hmm. that they had a go at just about every form of music that was then available. The Renaissance writers tended to focus on just one thing, and the same became true a bit in the 19th century, in that you associate, say, Chopin with piano music, but he didn't ever try to write an opera. And I think the great thing about um, the, the top of the tree people was their universality. And um, you can never grow tired of Bach. Mm. Um, I think probably most musicians would tell you the same. 
that he had a mathematical IQ that would have just had noughts and noughts on the end, mm. um, just to plan his works with the intricacy that he was able to. And yet such a sense of joy and communication that comes through. And it makes him inexhaustible. That's really, for me, genius. It's different from talent. I mean, listen, if you want talent speaking the same language, you could try Telemann, for mm. example. Um, who was much higher um, in public esteem than Bach in their lifetime. But look what's happened to him now. I mean, he's a barely remembered historical name. Where is Vivaldi in that? Vivaldi, um, I would say, was a very diligent master craftsman with flashes of genius, um, touched by genius. But his problem, I think, was lack of universality because I associate him with a certain kind of driving energy and vitality. Mm. Um, and he, uh, in the words of the rather unkind um, dictum about him, that he didn't write a thousand concertos, he wrote the same concerto a thousand times. Mm. He spoke an immensely attractive musical mm. language, um, which gives us a strong sense of its time and place. He's absolutely Venice mm. in the 18th century. And he was greatly admired by his contemporaries, including Bach, in the end, I couldn't put him up quite in the same league. But those, for me, were the musical geniuses. Um, I suppose there's a, a, a terribly well-filled second rank. Mm -hmm. um, I love, for example, the uh, American songwriters of the 20th century, the Broadway writers, Richard Rogers, mm -hmm. Jerome Kern, Stephen Sondheim, mm -hmm. um, all of those. Um, it happens to appeal to me. I love the musical theatre. But they never did anything else. They really just specialised in one area. And so you can't put them up there with Beethoven.